acknowledge the well-established protocol, but I want to add our worship leader in there, his first opportunity to be our liturgist, and he's done a wonderful job. Amen. You all may not know that, but he is the patrol leader for, I want to say, Eagle Patrol with the Boy Scouts. And he's somebody, you know. Amen. To our wonderful um, visiting physician, to our minister of music, and all the others that were included in that wonderful protocol. I am not Reverend Humes. She called me late last night. Uh, as you know, her family has again experienced death. And uh, we know that this time last year, they experienced death. And the two situations are very similar. That's difficult. That's just tough. But God knows how to carry us. As a wonderful Christian song says, the, the promise wasn't that we wouldn't go through those things, but that we'd be held. He knows how to hold us. When our whole world is falling apart, He can hold us. We're going to keep her in our prayers and her family. I want to draw your attention to Galatians chapter 5, one verse, verse 6. I'm going to read the Amplified Version of the Bible. For if we are in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith, activated and energized and expressed and working through love. Let us pray. Father, we ask that you send your word. Send it with power and send it with love. Send it in such a way to transform and change our lives for the rest of our lives. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. A serious incidental comment. A serious incidental comment. That's the sermon title. You know, last week I thought I was done for February. I finished the Black History Sermon Series. And I said, well, that was done. And I was getting ready for March. And then last night, of course, I get a phone call and I realized that I needed to prepare another sermon. And I wanted to say that this is a standalone. It's not a sermon series. It's just a standalone sermon, just one sermon. I don't do that very often because I like to go deeper into a topic. But this one will just stand alone. The first family, the Lord has taken us through places we didn't know were possible. You know, our, our, our nest is empty and our children are doing great, wonderful things in the world. And we've been places and seen things. And now we're back in little old Sumter, South Carolina. And, and we thought that was it, you know, just counting the days so we can, uh, you know, completely retire again and, and enjoy the future. And, and God is just saying, oh, no, hold on. You're just beginning. There's a whole wonderful world out there. And he's showing us revelations. We go to each other two or three times a day. Did you see this? Did you hear this? And God is showing. Sometimes before I could finish it, the sentence, Sister Black finishes it for me. We're rejoicing in all the wonderful things. And we're seeing the Bible in ways we hadn't seen it before. And God is releasing us from some of our old traditions and issues and things of the past. Our health is better. Our wealth is better. Our lives are better. And it's coming through this revelation that's coming in the Word. We're not the only ones. I look at you all, I see the same thing. I'm looking around, I see Sister LaShawn's in church today. Where was she last Sunday? Look where she is this Sunday. Amen. And the Lord is blessing on every hand. But what He's getting us to do is to drive out our traditional thinking. If we think the way that people have thought traditionally, we'll get what they got traditionally. And we're living in a completely different time and age. We're living in a time of grace and favor. That's a kick in the pants for me. I wish I had understood grace and favor when I first started. But no, I was one of those ones. I like to earn things. You know, I, my wife teases. I used to call me the Jamaican. I like to work for what I get. I worked two and three and four jobs to get what I needed, not realizing that grace and favor will carry me far more farther than my back could ever get me. And my labor could ever get me. Let me just tell you something. I used to hear this all my life and I didn't understand it until the last few years. Your money can work much harder than you. Amen. Did you hear what I just said? Amen. Your money can work 24-7. That's right. Your money doesn't have to sleep. 
You can't work 24-7. And there's some Ebenezer members trying to do it, but it won't work. And so I'm in this whole new world of grace and favor. And one of the key elements to walking in this new world of grace and favor is understand that the traditional story of sin is wrong. The way we talked about sin, the way we dealt with sin is wrong. In, in theology, they call that soteriology. So if you want to get a big word that sounds fantastic, you say the story of soteriology, the pastor said, is incorrect. It just needs a little correction. But the way we've been taught is completely wrong. It's all right and completely wrong. The principles are right, but used completely wrong. And that's been the problem. That's been the problem. So I don't want to just take a moment and say, put on your imaginary cap and go with me and let's look at this thing a different way. When I was in seminary, they had a movement called reimagining. How would the world look if we reimagined certain things? So let's just reimagine this story of soteriology. I want us to see the story of soteriology as the story of star-crossed lovers. You know, that's one of the archetypes of literature. Star-crossed lovers. And one of the classic stories that fits that archetype is the story of Romeo and Juliet. I bet everybody up here know about Romeo and Juliet, don't we? Romeo was a Montague, and Juliet was a Capulet. And those two families didn't get along. I could mention some names and some families in Maysville, and y'all say, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> they don't get along. They don't get along. Let me tell you, there's servants fight. The servants on one side fight the servants. Now, it doesn't say so in Shakespeare, but I'm sure they're pets fought each other. They hated each other. They, some of them didn't even know why they hated each other, but they hated each other. And in the middle of this situation comes these two teenagers, Romeo and Juliet. Now, let me say something, young folks. They got married as teenagers in that day, but today we want y'all, well, wait a little longer if you can. But here are these, these teenagers who are madly in love with each other, but there's so much in between them they can't get together. There's just all kinds of things in between them. So they come up with this plan. They come up with this deadly plan where they're going to put everything on the line to see can't they get together. Let's hold that there for a moment. We'll come back and pick that up in a few minutes, okay? God is so in love with us. It is a mate with every human being. Now that I'm trying to walk more in grace, I encounter someone that, you know, they're all in my face or they're angry or whatever. They're acting strange. And I start to pray about it. And God says, I love that one. I say, oh, yeah, you do, don't you, Lord? Now I have to figure out, now, why did he put us in this encounter? Because God loves everyone. And, and uh, when we studied about the love of God, God has a passion. Y'all remember that sermon? He has a passionate love for us. Now the, the theologians and Fosdeck is one in particular, he says that God has to act out of God's nature. Unlike, uh, not undifferent from humans, God has no control of God's nature. God's nature is God's nature. And God's nature makes him do things whether he really wants to do them or not. The same is true for us. And it is God's nature to love us. And no matter what we do, he loves us. No matter where we go, he loves us. No matter what circumstances we in, he loves us. And when we put ourselves in a bad situation, he loves us even more. But that's not what the church told me. The church pointed that finger down on me and you and told Star-crossed lovers. 
little issue. Unlike Romeo and Juliet, God's love is often unrequited. He expresses his love, but the lover doesn't respond. The loved one does not necessarily respond. So God has to put everything on the line, just like Romeo and Juliet. He has to put everything on the line to take care of the sin problem, the darkness problem, knowing that then maybe a few of those humans that he loves so passionately will love him back. They might not. But he's going to do something to take care of the sin problem. So what does God do? God takes the most important thing to him. He takes his only begotten son and he sends that son to earth to suffer and die so that light, now, now we get the part that he paid for our sins, but we need to understand so that light can come into us so that his light and our light can be together. Now we're so quick to point out Jesus is the one and he did. He died for the sinner. Yes, he did. He did. He did. But the Bible said in him was light. And that's John chapter 1 for those scholars. And the light was the life of man. He is that light that lighted every person. Paul said, I, I was light once and then darkness came. He's talking about coming to that age of accountability. And then he says to allow God to rekindle that light. Because that's the only way God can be with us is if we're light. So he hates sin. Not because of the action itself. But because it separates us from him. He wants to love us. And he wants to demonstrate that love and pour that love out on us. But our sin keeps us apart. There's another reason he hates sin. It beats us up. It beats us up. You know, uh, sin is, is this torment. It's capture us into these habits and things that just cause us more pain in our life. And he's tired of watching his loved one beaten up so. But it isn't about God just being just over in the sky zapping people as he pleases. It's a love story. Now, in the Romeo and Juliet story, it didn't work. Are they ruining it for anybody? Y'all knew the ending, right? It didn't work. It didn't work. The two lovers end up dead. In God's story, whether it worked or not, depends on us. Jesus took care of the sin problem. But whether we become lovers depend on, depends on us. Now, that's what Paul is talking about in Galatians chapter, oh, the entire book, but especially in chapter 5. That Jesus Christ has taken care of the sin matter. It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what you've done, what you're doing, or what you will do. He took care of that. That sin issue is off the table. Why does the church keep talking about it? Because they like guilt. And God said there shouldn't be guilt. There is therefore now, Wednesday night, there is therefore now no to those who are in Christ Jesus. We can't grow if people are constantly pointing out our faults and our sins and our shortcomings. What we need to look at is to have a righteous consciousness, not a sin consciousness. That that's an evil trick of the enemy to keep us fixated on the wrong part of our walk. You don't, you don't criticize a baby for falling down. You rejoice when the baby makes one step. God doesn't criticize us for falling down. He rejoices when we make one step, when we do one little thing better than we did before, when we're just reaching out a little higher, a little deeper, a little further. He's so excited. He said, look, look, look. That's my child. That's my favorite. You know what? We're all his favorite. Okay, three quick points. Love should be our motivation for understanding the Bible. And I'm going to change that and say love should be our motivation for salvation. We need to understand that everything in the Bible has to be seen through love. Even the cruel and difficult parts of the Bible has to be understood through love. You know, when a little child looks at a parent, often what the parent appears to be doing seems harsh and mean. I remember our girls when they were 
their little small kids and they got the little, you know, that, they're not even a year old, get that little tooth in their mouth, that little rice looking tooth there, and then Donna would take the, the um, she'd take the washcloth and clean their teeth and they would all oh, scream and yell and ooh, how mean mommy is. And sometimes God cleans our teeth and we yell and scream and say, oh, look how mean God is. God wants to take my fat back from me. God wants to, you know, we get all angry and holler and scream. Look how mean God is. And he's doing it because he loves us. Just like that mother. And you can go through so much of what we do with children. They don't understand. 